Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the three fire science exchanges for sponsoring this. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, present on the work that we've been doing over the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge my two collaborators that I've listed here. Justin Derner is a rangeland scientist with uh, the Rangeland Resources Research Unit out of Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, and Justin, uh, Justin started several of the long-term prescribed burning experiments back in the 2000s that I'll talk about today. And also want to acknowledge Dan Milchunas from Colorado State University. Dan's been working in the short grass step for over 30 years and back in the mid-90s he initiated uh, a series of studies with uh, Pawnee National Grassland on prescribed burning again. Uh, both of them uh, allowed me to become a collaborator on these projects when I started working here and I'll be talking about those studies today. Okay, so what I want to do with this webinar is first I'll just talk briefly about uh, climate gradients and fire in the Great Plains and a little bit on traditional and contemporary perspectives on fire use uh, in the Great Plains. And then I'm going to talk about uh, just some of the technical aspects of getting prescribed burns to work in the low fuel environment of the short grass. And then I'll get into the ecology of prescribed burning effects on forage production, livestock production, um, unpalatable plant species, and then wildlife habitat. And this last one, wildlife habitat, is really what's driven a lot of the interest in recent years in uh, prescribed burning in short grass steppe. So uh, in, in looking at the, uh, the Great Plains or the central grassland regions uh, of the United States, there's a lot of different ways to divide up this region into grassland types. I like this broad classification shown in this slide because it reflects some of the broad climate gradients. And uh, what I'm really going to be focusing on today is work done in that orange region in the southern and westernmost portion of the Great Plains. Uh, and some of it is also going to be applicable to uh, the western portion of the northern mixed prairie. But this is where most of the work that we've done is coming from. Uh, the two main climatic gradients that we have, first of all, we have a west to east gradient in uh, precipitation and as a result, uh, west to east uh, gradient in net primary production that has a huge effect on uh, fire ecology. And of course, here in the eastern Great Plains, uh, fire is widely used. We have a lot of uh, research on the role of fire in tall grass prairie and in mixed grass prairies. Uh, in the western part, uh, much lower fuel loads and um, a little bit less work on the role of fire. We also have a, an important temperature gradient that runs from north to south. So when we're talking about the short grass step, we're talking about the, uh, the driest and the warmest part of the Great Plains. The dry aspect of it is uh, resulting in a reduction in fuel loads, considerable reduction in fuel loads compared to the eastern parts of the Great Plains. So uh, low fuel loads, and um, but also uh, this is a pretty warm part of the Great Plains, so we have a lot of opportunities uh, for fire ignition uh, during dry parts of the year or during uh, dormant uh, portions of the year. Now, I don't have uh, any way of making a firm statement about what the historic fire return interval was in the short grass steppe. Uh, I know that when I worked with the land fire program five or six years ago, uh, they said that of all the different ecologists they uh, interviewed in this region, uh, there's a lot of disagreement over what the fire return intervals were here historically. And I think that's just because we don't have, we don't have trees, we don't have a good way of using fire scars on trees to assess fire regimes. Uh, but we do know that uh, historically fire was a significant component of the short grass steppe. Wright and Bailey in their book on fire ecology noted that in the semi-arid areas, big prairie fires in the past usually occurred during drought years that followed one to three years of above average precipitation because of the abundant and continuous fuel. And so we do have a lot of interannual variability in uh, the potential for fires. Uh, and we know that we have a lot of small wildfires um, frequently in the western Great Plains, but historically there's also good evidence there were large fires that we're able to spread over broad areas. An example from Wright and Bailey's book, uh, they noted that a fire in 1885 that started near the Arkansas River in western Kansas jumped the Cimarron River, burned across the northern plains of Texas, and did not stop until it reached the rugged Canadian River breaks, a distance of 175 miles, 
and about a million acres of the XIT ranch alone burned in Texas. And a more recent example came from Lee County, New Mexico, where a fire traveled 26 miles, burned 52 square miles, and crossed three major highways and was finally stopped by a plowed field. So today we have a, a different situation with an extensive network of roads, croplands, and volunteer fire departments that effectively suppress wildfires. In terms of traditional thinking on use of fire in managing rangelands, just want to start out by contrasting what happens in the tall grass prairies, at least in the southern portions in the Flint Hills of Kansas and Oklahoma, where like in this photo you have entire ranches or at least entire pastures burned annually. That's done to enhance forage quality, remove all that old stem biomass. And uh, again, whole pastures are burned to encourage uniform utilization by livestock. And on the other side of the Great Plains in the short grass, we have fires widely suppressed and rarely used to manage rangeland. So the reasons for this, uh, on the, in tall grass, we know that we have substantial benefits of fire to livestock production by enhancing forage quality, uh, removing uh, standing dead and increasing access to forage by livestock. Uh, we also have major issues in the eastern Great Plains with tree and shrub encroachment, particularly juniper in both mixed and tall grass prairies. And juniper encroachment is really starting to uh, be a major impetus for the use of prescribed, uh, prescribed fire in the eastern half of the Great Plains. And also you have adequate fuels for burning every year. So in the short grass step, uh, you have the opposite situation. A lot of livestock producers have concerns about the effects of livestock production, uh, effects of fire on livestock production, mainly because of uh, concerns about losing forage quantity. Uh, we really don't have any issues with tree and shrub encroachment. We'll talk a little bit about cactus and subshrubs later. And uh, in some years, uh, we have lack of adequate fuels, and certainly there's a perception that it's very difficult to burn in the short grass uh, region. At least in Wright and Bailey's original book, they said that uh, it's really not much of a reason to burn in short grass, and it's often difficult to do so. More current situation, we see things changing in the eastern tall grass prairies and in the mixed grass prairies, where we're thinking not in terms of burning whole ranches or landscapes, but uh, more of a heterogeneous application of fire where you have portions of large pastures burnt and portions left unburnt. Uh, again, we're moving in that direction in the short grass also in terms of how we approach uh, implementing prescribed burning. In the tall grass, uh, a lot of work now is focusing on patchy fires integrated with grazing management to enhance heterogeneity, and uh, that's being driven by uh, increased understanding of how uh, fire and grazing influence habitat for wildlife, species of conservation concern, prairie grouse, like lesser and greater prairie chickens, as well as songbirds. And also uh, because of implications for managing tree encroachment. In the short grass, uh, we're also interested in patchy application of fire for the same reasons. Uh, we're interested in using uh, patch burning to enhance habitat for wildlife, species of conservation concern, and I'll talk about mountain plovers and prairie dogs, and also management for unpalatable plant species, subshrubs, uh, unpalatable grasses, and cactus. So first I want to address the, the basic question of when does short grass burn. Uh, for the past <clears throat> seven years, starting in 2007, every time that we've been conducting uh, prescribed burns at our uh, Central Plains Experimental Range, we've been collecting data on fuel loads and also putting out data loggers out in the fi uh, fire where we uh, collect uh, information on the temperature of the fires, uh, temperatures of the head fires at ground level. And so we've uh, uh, pulled together a database from all of those uh, prescribed burns. Uh, we're burning both in spring and fall. And each of the rows in this database represents the average of three or four uh, prescribed burns that are done on a single day. Again, we're collecting, we're measuring standing biomass, the fuel load, uh, some weather variables, and then the fire temperatures. And I'll just briefly show you average peak fire temperatures measured by uh, the thermocouples. And uh, if we graph this out, the, the best uh, factor explaining variation in peak fire temperatures is fuel load. That's not too surprising considering we're working in a really low fuel environment. Uh, and we have a pretty clear relationship here. And then the variation around that relationship is mainly associated with variation in weather variables. So one group of burns up here in the region where we've got uh, about 
700 to 1200 kilograms per hectare fuel loads and they're burning around 150 to 190 degrees Celsius at uh, ground level. That's right at the height of plant meristems. Uh, another group with lower fire intensity in the 350 to 600 kilogram per hectare fuel load range. And then we have this group down here. This is where our fires completely fail uh, and only propagate in a, in a patchy fashion. So I'll show you what these three groups look like. And also I just want to point out on the left, we have fires w which are essentially failed, um, really not blackening the target area and uh, not propagating in a consistent fashion. This is, is, this is what happens when we try to burn with the uh, uh, fuel loads less than 350 kilograms per hectare. This is more typical in the center of what we uh, prescribe burning conditions, 350 to 700 kilograms per hectare. And this is a uh, high intensity fire. So in the center, what, this is typically the kind of fuel loads we'll get if we have average precipitation and uh, a site that's grazed at moderate stocking rates during the growing season. On the left, this happens about, well, in the past seven years, we've seen this happen two out of seven years. We've had these conditions three out of seven years. And then we've had these above average precipitation conditions two out of seven years. And uh, what we found is that burning with much lower relative humidity than has traditionally been re recommended is necessary in short grass. So we're typically burning at relative humidities of 10 to 20 percent, air temperatures in the 60s Fahrenheit, and wind speeds of 7 to 15 miles per hour. And that really seems to be ideal. And then uh, under those conditions, the two different fuel loads produce the two different temperature ranges. I also want to point out these temperature ranges are quite low. Uh, considerably lower than what you get in mixed or tall grass prairie and as a result are really unlikely to uh, cause uh, mortality of most of the grass meristems and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So in terms of effects on forage production we've looked at this extensively. We have uh, working with Dan Melchunas uh, we measured uh, effects of fire on forage production on eight different prescribed burns that were done on Pawnee National Grassland over a five-year period for each of those burns, we found no effect uh, of burning on forage production. And this just shows a summary uh, averaged across all eight of those burns. No effect on forage production and no effect on the uh, plant functional groups. We also did a more recent study, 2007 and 2008, again in collaboration with Pawnee National Grassland, where we did a factorial arrangement of burning and grazing. And so uh, we had sites that were burned and unburned. And then uh, all of the sites were grazed the year before the burn. And then the year after the burn, the first growing season, uh, we had sites that were both grazed and ungrazed. And across all those treatments, again, we found no, no negative effects of burning on forage production and uh, no concerns about grazing the site the first year after burning. In that study, we also looked at forage digestibility early in the growing season. Uh, in general, forage digestibility, even on unburned sites, is fairly high. But uh, on burn sites, uh, forage digestibility was significantly enhanced uh, by burning. And I'll also point out, I've, uh, for this presentation, I've put citations at the bottom of slides where I've included some data. And uh, if you're interested in details, uh, the, the web, or excuse me, the PowerPoint will be posted on the Great Plains Fire Science Network's webpage, and you can uh, find the citations there if you're interested in checking them out further. So uh, the next step, what we wanted to look at was the effect of burning on livestock production. And to do this, uh, we decided to take uh, an approach that integrates fire into grazing management using patch burn grazing. Uh, this is an approach that is uh, very well known in the eastern half of the Great Plains and is becoming more and more widely used in tall grass and mixed grass prairies. Uh, it seeks to mimic the historic interaction between fire and grazing. And we have prescribed burns applied to only a portion of a pasture each year, allowing livestock to choose among burned and unburned patches. And then burned and intensively grazed patches are shifted in location over time to prevent long-term degradation in any given part of a pasture. So we uh, conducted a patch burning experiment in short grass step. A lot of folks were saying, well, this really doesn't apply to the short grass. It's too arid here. It doesn't make sense. So we wanted to test out patch burn grazing uh, in this more semi-arid environment. We had three pastures uh, in traditional treatment, cattle grazing at moderate stocking rates without burning, and then three patch burn pastures where cattle were grazed at moderate stocking rates and 25% of the pasture was burned each year. 
And so this is what the treatments look like. So over a four-year period, the entire pasture gets burnt. Uh, this is a person out here in the middle for scale. And uh, as you can see, um, even though these uh, pastures are being grazed every year during the growing season, we do have sufficient fuel loads for uh, relatively homogeneous burns. And, uh, burned quite well in all four years of the study. This ran from 2007 through 2011. And then we, uh, these pastures were stocked with yearling steers. We put GPS collars on a subset of the steers in each pasture and looked at their selection of burn sites. This is an example. Uh, the green boundary shows the boundary of the pasture. This is the quarter that had just been burned. This is the water tank. And then all these blue dots show the location of a steer um, every five minutes for about three weeks. Yeah, and so I see the question about uh, erosion after the fall burns. Um, I'll show you some pictures of it if I, I think here in a couple, but um, we did measure erosion rates both on, both on burned and unburned pastures. I don't have that data in this presentation, but the uh, erosion was quite minimal because uh, when you're burning in short, in short grass step, uh, the basal cover of the, of the blue gram is substantial. <laughs> and all that remains after the burn. So um, in terms of looking at the cattle responses, um, we see in this case in, Ju in June of 2008, this is an example where it was during a dry period, hadn't rained uh, in about three weeks prior to the start of tracking the cattle, and they didn't select the burn. Uh, in August of 2008, after we had some thunderstorms in July uh, and things were greening up, we see pretty strong selection for the burn. So it's variable uh, from month to month. And then this is an example of interannual variation. Uh, here's an example where cattle were selecting the burn uh, in this particular year. The next year, uh, during this time interval, this is the middle of the growing season in July, they were really just selecting uh, swales. This is a lowland here and a lowland here. Uh, and not selecting the burn at all. So here was controlled by topography. And here they were uh, significantly selecting the burn, but at a lesser intensity than two years prior. So a lot of interannual and uh, <clears throat> within season variation. And then uh, averaged over this entire four year study, we found that cattle selected burns. Um, they did selectively graze on burns, 31% of their grazing time on burns that made up 25% of the pasture. And we found a really strong selection mainly occurred uh, during periods of green up with no selection uh, during periods of uh, either unchanging biomass or plant senescence. And this graph is just to show that. I won't get into the details. We also looked at weight gains over the uh, four years. These are the four years that we burned the pastures. And what we found is in three of the years, the first two and the fourth, we had no no effect on livestock weight gains. Uh, in 2010, uh, we had a significant positive effect of burning on livestock weight gains. This followed above average production in 2009, above average plant production in 2009. So we see a benefit in 2010 when we're burning off some of that excess standing dead biomass. And then we also uh, just measured weight gains in 2012. This was a drought year that occurred after four years of burning, and we found no, no residual effects of burning uh, in that fifth year. We're also interested in uh, response to the other herbivore, or other ruminant herbivore that's out here, the pronghorn. Uh, we started out just looking at their responses in spring and summer, and there was a response in spring, but it was uh, pretty limited. And just by observation, we realized that they were having a much stronger response to burning in the, in the winter. So these burns were occurring, occurring in October or early November. And for the, about two months after burning, we'd see really strong selection of the burns by pronghorn. So just an example. So down here, this green is uh, the densities of pronghorn on burns in the spring. And then the density of pronghorn on unburned pastures, that little blip there is the, is the error bar. Uh, so it's like undetectable. So there's a significant difference between spring burn and unburned, or significant difference between burns in spring and unburned, but you can see there's just a huge increase in uh, pronghorn densities in the winter, uh, about 20 times greater, and uh, just by going out and watching them, we realize that they're feeding mostly on the burned cactus cladodes that you can see this stubble here in the foreground of the slides, and uh, we quantified this and found that uh, much higher damage to uh, cactus cladodes on these patch burns as a result of being bitten or uprooted. A lot of the times the 
pronghorn were not uh, consuming the claydoads. They were uprooting the whole plant and then consuming the roots or the bases of the claydoads, but they were really only doing that on burns. And so as a result of that, both the direct effect of burning and the follow-up impact of the pronghorn consumption, we found that fall patch burns had a really strong effect on cactus densities. Uh, in the first year, we had an 80% reduction in cactus density, and that persisted out for the next four years. In other years, we're getting around uh, 50 to 70% reductions, but uh, strong effects of fall patch burns on cactus. So in terms of cactus, at least in northeastern Colorado, we're particularly interested in this because we have fairly substantial cactus densities in many places. And uh, we've been able, we've also looked at the direct effects of spring burning on uh, cactus densities. Those burns that I mentioned earlier that we were studying on the Pawnee National Grassland were all done in late winter, typically in March. Uh, and we see, we do see a significant effect of those burns on uh, cactus. Uh, but that effect is much much smaller than what we observe with fall burning. In the, in the spring, uh, with burning, I'm, I'm unable to get the slides to advance at this point, but in the spring, when we are, oh, here we go, uh, burning in, in March or early April, uh, we see a re reduced clado density by about 35% during the first post-burn growing season in one study. This is based on three different burns. And then another uh, study that was done several years later, we found clado density was lower on burn during the first uh, first, first post-burn growing season, but those effects were not statistically significant. Uh, okay, and when we talk about late winter burns, uh, I just want to clarify that. Um, these are typically burns that are being done by the Forest Service on the national grasslands, and these are done at a time when uh, there's no snow cover. Again, uh, you usually have some days in March that are pretty warm, uh, at least up in the 50s, sometimes in the, in the 60s for air temperature and relative humidity is quite low. Um, I didn't, don't know the relative humidity on these burns, uh, probably a little higher than what we typically use, but uh, dry conditions and certainly no um, recent precipitation. We find there is an effect on cactus, but it's certainly not uh, the magnitude of an effect that we would like to see in some cases. Also, when we return to these studies after the first post-burn growing season, we haven't quantified it. But when you just look around, you don't, you're not impressed with the, the amount of cactus control. With these fall burning studies, uh, we found that it reduces clado density on average 66%, the range of 50 to 80. And that uh, effect persists out to at least a 50% reduction um, out to the third post-burn growing season. When you go out to these sites, you can really notice an effect compared to adjacent pastures. Another species I want to talk about is broom snake weed. In some portions of the, of the Western Great Plains, there's interest in controlling this species because uh, it is unpalatable and can be toxic to livestock. Uh, work done by McDaniel and his colleagues in northeastern New Mexico um, what they showed is if you're burning in late winter, you can get 65% shrub mortality on average. Um, they also did some work burning in the summer, in June or July, and got much higher shrub mortality. Uh, but I just point out they also discussed how this is a much more consistent burn window. Uh, if you want to burn in the summer, uh, you really have to wait for just the right conditions. Uh, we generally are unable to burn in the summer uh, in northeastern Colorado. And uh, McDaniel, based on his work in northeastern New Mexico, recommending burning with a total fuel biomass of more than 500 kilograms per hectare, uh, which you certainly can get with uh, slightly above average precipitation and moderate cattle uh, stocking rates. Relative humidity, again, quite low, 10 to 20 percent. That's really what we've seen also. Uh, air temperatures in the 70s, a little warmer in New Mexico. And the most important thing that we found uh, throughout the, the rangelands where blue gramma is dominant, you really have to have blue gramma completely senescent. If there's green material in um, if there's green material in the blue gramma, uh, prescribed burning can be pretty difficult. Okay, and then uh, one other example I wanted to talk about. This comes from, from work being done uh, in the northern mixed prairie in Montana. Uh, this is with Lance Vermeer and his colleagues out of Miles City. And uh, what they've shown is with summer burning, they've been able to 
really have a negative impact on purple freon. This is an unpalatable grass species that uh, sometimes rangeland managers are interested in controlling. Uh, with summer burns in August or September, this is when the grasses are uh, the dominant C4 grasses are senesced. Uh, you can get uh, declines of 73 to 90 percent. And with fall burns uh, in October after the first hard frost, uh, you can get three on biomass declines of 58 to 73 percent. And uh, they also did a nice follow-up study where uh, they actually quantified uh, how the, 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 the fire temperatures and the duration of fire temperature above 60 degrees Celsius was related to three on mortality. And what they're finding is they're getting really high mortality rates out in this, this range. This kind of heat intensity is probably not something uh, you can achieve if you're burning in uh, blue grama dominated rangeland in the short grass step, we can probably achieve uh, under high fuel loads, uh, heat loads in this kind of this kind of range. And then I just want to uh, conclude with a little bit of talking about uh, uh, prescribed burning for wildlife habitat. This is what's really, uh, I think, driven a lot of a lot of renewed interest in prescribed burning in the short grass step. Uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, I think a lot of the national grasslands have started fire programs uh, during the late 1990s. Uh, all four of the species show here, shown here exhibit positive responses to prescribed burning. Um, I've already talked about the response of pronghorn. Uh, this, is, uh, this kind of response has also been documented in the northern mixed prairie, in uh, the western part of the northern mixed prairie, both in Montana and Wyoming, uh, pretty much uh, in other portions of the Great Plains where you have cactus. Uh, I won't say too much about swift fox. Um, swift fox are a species associated with very short vegetation structure. Their main source of mortality is predation from coyotes. So uh, they select short statured habitats where they can see a long distance. And uh, again, we, we did one a small study in southeastern Colorado on the Comanche National Grassland uh, where we found that Swift foxes are at least not negatively affected uh, by prescribed burning in terms of their home ranges, and they selectively uh, place their den sites within prescribed burns. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the other two. This is mountain plover and prairie dogs. So uh, in terms of prescribed burning and prairie dogs, uh, obviously prairie dogs are another species that's uh, closely associated with very short vegetation structure, uh, well known that they create short vegetation structure, but they also respond to it. Um, we did one study, uh, in, again, this is from southeastern Colorado on the Comanche National Grassland, where we looked at one wildfire and four prescribed burns that were all done adjacent to uh, prairie dog colonies. And this is an example here. Uh, this dotted area is the outline of a wildfire. Here's where the lightning struck, burned into a county road that was right here. And then for each of these, this, this wildfire and for all the prescribed burns, what we do is look at the, the boundary of the prairie dog colony prior to the burn and then how much it expands after the burn and look at how much uh, the prairie dogs are expanding into the burn versus the unburned areas. And we had about twice as high uh, expansion rates into burns compared to unburned grassland. And this was actually during a dry period when um, uh, prairie dog colonies were expanding quite rapidly, even in unburned grassland. I suspect we'd see a much stronger burn response if we were able to redo this in um, a wetter conditions or in a wetter year. And I do understand. I've talked to some other folks that are um, talked to some other folks uh, that have used prescribed burning to manage prairie dog distribution. At least a, a Christy Painter up on the Thunder Basin National Grassland has mentioned that they've uh, had some success in using burning to uh, manipulate colony expansion patterns up there as well. Uh, another reason we're interested in prescribed burning is be, uh, in order to manipulate vegetation structure for grassland birds. Uh, this is a graphic published by Fritz Knopf in 1996, widely reprinted, and he just was pointing out that uh, variation in habitat for different species of grassland birds often seems to be associated with variation in grazing pressure and vegetation structure. He was arguing that this kind of bare uh, sparse prostrate uh, vegetation structure that's associated with breeding habitat for mountain plover is probably uh, driven by either excessive or very heavy grazing pressures. 
more recently we've recognized that we can probably also do the same thing and perhaps do it more effectively with prescribed burning. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work that Justin Derner and I did over the past five years looking at uh, use of prescribed burning to generate short vegetation structure and bare ground uh, for breeding mountain plovers. A mountain plover is a species, there's certainly been a lot of interest in managing for this species on public lands in the Western Great Plains. It was uh, proposed for listing at the end of the 90s, went through a bunch of litigation, and is currently um, not listed uh, federally, but uh, is on the list of species of conservation concern for all of the states in the Western Great Plains. So here's an example of a mountain plover on its nest in shortgrass steppe. Hopefully you can see it there in the red circle. This is a mountain plover nesting on a prescribed burn on the Cimarron National Grassland in southwest Kansas. And also it's uh, placed its nest right next to a cow pie. So you can see uh, this species really exemplifies that kind of interaction uh, between fire and grazing. I'd also point out that just the fact that you have a species that responds so strongly to both fire and grazing it's probably an indication of the importance of those two processes interacting historically in this landscape. Over a four-year period, we did a study uh, in northeastern Colorado, both on the Pawnee National Grassland and the Central Plains Experimental Range, where we compared uh, variation in two vegetation attributes, bare soil exposure and vegetation height, across different kinds of treatments. And these blue bars here show different levels of grazing intensity. And then what I just want to point out here is that we looked at uh, dormant season burns, both prescribed burns and wildfires, and these were both fall and spring. And we also compared them to prairie dog colonies. We find that uh, prescribed burning is effective in generating much higher levels of bare soil and much lower vegetation heights than is uh, heavy grazing alone, and generates very similar structure to what you find on prairie dog colonies. And then uh, during this same four-year period, we went out and did extensive surveys trying to find mountain plovers and their nest sites and measure vegetation attributes around the nests. This is an example. This is a one square meter plot looking straight down on it and taking a photograph of it. And this is on a prairie dog colony. And here is the mountain plover nest right in the center. And here's another one square meter plot on a prescribed burn with a mountain plover nest right in the middle of the three egg clutch. And we measured 106 nest and foraging sites over four years. And what we found is average bare soil exposure around those sites is uh, quite high, 35%. Average vegetation height less than four centimeters. And if you compare that to the management treatments that we studied, if you compare that to the management treatments we studied, um, mountain plover nest sites, uh, both bare soil and vegetation height is very similar to randomly selected sites on burns. And uh, also on prairie dog colonies. And in fact, we found uh, uh, over the past six years of surveys on this study area, we've found about half of the nests on prairie dog colonies and about half on prescribed birds or on wildfires. We we're also interested in how vegetation structure and variation in vegetation structure generated by prescribed burning influences other bird species. This is from our patch burn grazing study. And uh, here uh, we have variation in vegetation structure uh, among patches in the landscape. Each point here represents a 40-acre site uh, where we measure the average vegetation structure over the 40-acre site and then uh, measure uh, the density of different bird species there. So these sites on the left are sites that have been burned prior to the growing season, and these are sites that haven't been burned yet. And what you see is species like lark bunning, uh, are much more abundant in unburned grassland. Species like corn lark are much more abundant in burned grassland. Um, and other species show more dichotomous results. Uh, grasshoppers and brewer sparrows only present at the tall end of the spectrum, and mountain plovers only present on current season burns. So in terms of uh, some of the conclusions from our patch burn grazing management study, um, I don't think I hit on this slide earlier, so I'll go through them, but we saw no negative effect of burns on forage production and a small positive effect on forage quality. We saw that cattle select burns during green up, no selection other times in the growing season. A neutral or positive effect on cattle weight gains, a strong pronghorn response during winter, and as a result of that interaction with fire, a negative effect 
of fall burning on cactus abundance, uh, and overall that burning seems to be effective in managing habitat for disturbance-dependent grassland birds. So I'd say none of these uh, factors are as compelling or as economically important as the results you see in, in tall grass and mixed grass prairie, but there are a lot of uh, benefits that you can achieve with burning, and um, with the right spatial configuration, uh, you can mitigate any of the um, potential negative effects. Also want to point out in terms of, uh, I think it's important to think carefully about the landscape around a site that you're thinking of conducting a burn in. Um, I just want to give an example from the Central Plains Experimental Range where we did that patch burn study. So in 2006, prior to starting that study, we had uh, four large prairie dog colonies at the station and we had mountain plovers breeding on those colonies. And right at the end of 2006 and early in 2007, all of those colonies died out as a result of plague. So we went from several thousand acres of prairie dog colonies down to just tens of acres of prairie dog colonies. Mountain plovers are migratory, so when they came back in uh, the beginning of the breeding season in 2007, uh, those prairie dog colonies were gone. And instead, the next year we started a patch burn management experiment. And so um, right at the time when the prairie dog habitat had been lost in the landscape. We were initiating or creating new habitat through our burning program. And I think that's probably uh, one of the reasons that we had mountain plovers breeding on our patch burns each year. And then over that four year period from 2007 to 2010, each year we're providing habitat for plovers in that same landscape. So I just want to point out that these, uh, I don't have evidence, I didn't have uh, tags on any of the plovers. We don't know if it's the same birds coming back, but it's quite likely because uh, mountain plovers are phylopatric and generally come back to the same approximate area each year. So for just putting um, burns out on the landscape randomly, um, there's going to be a lower probability of actually providing uh, habitat for species like mountain plovers. Uh, and it's important to think about where the source popul populations may be. All right, so I just want to briefly conclude uh, with uh, some comments on planning for multiple objectives. Um, I think you really can achieve uh, multiple object objectives for the plant community, for rangeland management, and for wildlife management if we think carefully about the timing and location of prescribed burns. In terms of bird location, the three considerations I think are most important are just, first of all, simply what's, what plant species are present and what kind of opportunities do you have for suppression of things like cactus, snakeweed, or treon. Um, the fuel loads that we have in short grass step um, are low enough that you really do have to think carefully about that and whether you can achieve um, control of those species on a particular site. And then it's also very important to think about pasture boundaries and the timing of cattle use. We can improve forage quality on burns early in the growing season, but if you burn and then you run into a dry year, where uh, you don't have a significant green up in the spring, you want to make sure that you still have a significant portion of that pasture that remains unburned and has that residual standing dead forage available for cattle to utilize at least early in the growing season before that uh, residual material starts to get lost to wind and lost from just uh, the action of rain and hail. And then um, in our prescribed burning experiment, in our patch burning experiment, we were burning a quarter of the pasture each year. I would probably, in a management situation, ideally want to be doing less than that, maybe on the order of a tenth or an eighth of the pasture in a given year, so that you have a substantial amount of that remaining unburned. And um, I'd also, uh, if you're going to only be burning a, a small portion of the pasture, that means you're probably going to be needing to work in large pastures so that you can uh, still do reasonably sized burns. And then in terms of proximity to wildlife populations, you need to think about adjacency to prairie dog colonies. And in terms of if you're burning for mountain plovers, um, adjacency to other past burns or cropland or plague-affected prairie dog colonies uh, that might provide a source population. And then uh, for burn timing, uh, we are in a low fuel situation. I think we can uh, burn in short grass. I think we can burn in a lot more years than uh, might be suggested by some of the earlier prescribed burning guides, uh, such as those provided by Wright and Bailey, uh, provided that we have the right weather. Uh, but 
if we don't have enough rainfall during the previous growing season, if you have a drought year during the previous growing season or a drought or a dry year even, it just doesn't make any sense to try burning. Sometimes we get funding to go do a burn in a particular location, we get a dry year and we go forward with it anyway and then just have limited success. So you really got to be above that 350 kilogram per hectare threshold which means we may only be able to burn in six or seven or eight years out of ten. And then in terms of timing of growth and senescence of the primary fuel species, you need to think about you know, basically when is blue gramma senesced and how does that relate to uh, the growth patterns of species you might want to control. That'll help you in thinking about whether you want to use spring or summer or fall burns. And then uh, looking at the weather conditions. Again, we like to be in pretty low, hu low humidity, 10 to 20 percent and at least have winds that are above six miles per hour uh, temperatures in the 60s. So um, I think I'm going to conclude here. Uh, I just want to conclude with this slide because I think it really exemplifies uh, how you can use fire to achieve multiple objectives. They're all shown here. Uh, first of all, uh, we've got a lot of green forage with no standing dead biomass mixed in with it. So you've got an improvement in forage quality for livestock. You can see most of the cactus cladodes in this slide have been killed by the fire. And then also this, this uh, apparent cladode right here is a mountain plover chick. Uh, mountain plover chicks look like this about, for about the first week after they hatch. And it's really amazing to me how they look exactly like a burnt cladode and probably explains why they like to uh, nest on prescribed burns. Um, I also just want to um, thank a lot of folks that really did a lot of the work on the prescribed burning experiments, Pat McCusker and Dave Smith from here in Fort Collins, uh, Mary Ashby, Jeff Thomas, and Troy Smith uh, who work out at the Central Plains Experimental Range, and then Nicole Kaplan from uh, CSU. So um, I think we have time now and I'd be happy to try to answer some of the questions that I see here below. David, one person asked on your past burn grazing studies if you had a change in grass species composition. So we did a lot of work looking at that. We looked at you know forage production and uh, plant species composition. And the answer is, if you just want to say herbaceous species or grass species, no, we don't see any shifts. The only effect on the plant community we've seen in prescribed burning is the effect on cactus <coughs> and also I should also have mentioned we do see in, in prescribed burns that have broom snakeweed on them we also see very similar results in terms of killing broom snakeweed in northeastern Colorado uh, very similar to what was shown for northeastern New Mexico but in terms of grass species we see no effect whatsoever um, and again that I think that relates back to what I showed you with the fire temperatures um, those thermocouples we're putting out are at one centimeter above ground level, so they're right at the height of the meristems of the grass crowns, and um, those are not very high temperatures at all. There's not anywhere up in the range where uh, research has shown you start to get plant meristem mortality. Uh, we have done uh, a, a second experiment that I didn't talk about where we've repeatedly burned a site over and over and over. So. After burning the same patches for four years in a row, we did start to see um, slight negative effects on the C3 grasses. Uh, but we don't see any, any of that if you burn a site just once or twice. Thanks, David. I think you have one more question there asking about domestic animals and um, have you seen any effects on cactus abundance after fires? Yeah, we'd like to test that. I think that's a very good idea. Okay, so the question is, can I see any domestic animals having the same effect on cactus abundance after prescribed fires as pronghorn do? Uh, I think that's a great idea. Um, I have talked to one rancher uh, up here in northeastern Colorado that has done that. Um, he's had some wildfires on his property and then placed cattle on that pasture uh, when most of the other grasses were dormant. and. Uh, he told me he had good success with that, but I have we have not done any experiments with it. And uh, again, I would say you probably need to do that in the dormant season. As soon as you start having some significant green up in the spring, I'm not sure if the cattle will continue to take the, the cactus. 
Uh, while you think about any other questions you had, I just want to reiterate that we have recorded the webinar and that will get posted on the Great Plains Fire Science Exchange website and we also plan on posting it at frames for those of you that um, can't reach um, some of the other websites and you're used to using frames. Um, so we want to thank David for uh, making it through some tech questions here. And uh, thank all of you for tuning in. And we hope that uh, you learned something new. And, um, this was a valuable webinar. Oh, uh, right. One other point. Um, those of you that uh, were hoping to get uh, continuing education credits from the Society for Range Management, you can do that um, by turning in a form. And that form is posted on the Great Plains website. It is also posted to our blog. Um, and if you can't find it in those places, send uh, an email to gpfiresigns at missouristate.edu. Um, so if you can fill out that form and send it back to us, uh, we'll get your name on the roster and make sure you get credit. And thanks again. David, did you have any parting words? No, thanks for hosting this.